Good morning. Welcome to the Independent Democratic Coalition's press availability. I'm the leader, Chris Tuck, and joined with me today from District 19 is Representative Garen Tarr, representing Airport Heights and Mountain View, also serving on Resources and the Health and Social Services Committee. And then we have uh, Representative Matt Clayman, representing West Anchorage from District 21. He's on Transportation, Energy, and Judiciary Committees. Uh, visiting this week, we have the Tourism Industry Association, the Kenai River Sport Fishing Association, NEA Alaska Board, and the Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired visiting Juneau. Uh, the annual Juno Choose Respect March Rally um, begins Thursday here at noon and goes to 1 o'clock. The keynote speaker will be Lieutenant Governor Byron Malott. And KTOO is hosting a forum at 360 this evening on how toxics are tainting subsistence food web, our homes, and our bodies. And Senators Donnie Olson and Bill Wilikowski uh, are expected to participate. And then on Thursday from 11.30 to 1 up in House Finance is David Teal's uh, presentation on the fiscal reality, exploring scenarios to reclaim budget solvency. And that's an interactive uh, program that he puts together. People are able to input, hey, if you do this to the budget, what's the outcomes on, on it? So it's a good presentation. You don't want to miss it. It will be re-aired on Gavel to Gavel sometime in the future. Uh, this week is also the National Zone Work Zone Awareness Week. In Alaska, we've had almost 80 accidents um, in the construction work crashes last year. Um, that's a huge number, so just be aware of the construction work zones. When you go in and be, pay attention to the signs, pay attention to the uh, worksite traffic control supervisor, those that are um, doing the stop slow down paddles. Um, at those work zones. And the 2015 Native Issues Forum will continue Thursday in Juneau at the Elizabeth Parodovich Hall. Uh, the speakers will be the Department of Health and Social Services Commissioner Valerie Davidson and the First Alaska's Institute CEO Elizabeth Medicine Crow. And don't forget the deadline for your permanent fund dividend application is this coming Tuesday, a week from today, March 31st. Uh, on there you can do uh, online and uh, please pick click and give to those uh, charitable organizations that are important to you. And I would like to turn it over to Representative uh, Clayman. Thanks, Chris. Thank you all for coming. Oops. Coming this morning. The, uh, I want to talk, we've got some pretty interesting times here and there's a couple of topics that have been going on that I've been pretty involved with that I want to speak to. The first is the, the Whammy Medical School Program. Whammy stands for Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. And that's a program where Alaska has been getting this great investment in terms of training medical students because we can offer in-state tuition to our to Alaskans who want to go to medical school. It's been a program that's been going on for over 25 years and a collection of Northwest states work together, the five states, to offer that in-state tuition. It's a really good investment for Alaska. Interestingly enough, you look at other states, for Alaska to send the 20 students a year to Whammy, it costs Alaska about four and a half dollars per capita per year to have the 20 students going to medical school at in-state rates. Go to Texas and you ask, what are you paying on a per capita basis to have in-state medical students? The answer is over $22 per person uh, per capita investment in having in-state medical schools. And that's, that's one of the ways in which you provide the need for bringing doctors back home. It's been a great return for Alaska. For every 20 students we send, they spend their first year in Anchorage doing their first year medical school in Anchorage. For every 20 students that we send to the program, 17 come back to Alaska and practice medicine in Alaska. And that's a great return on our, our investment. You know, the troubling part about a program that's working so well was that uh, the, in the House budget would support uh, from the majority, they they added intent language that would require the state to notify University of Washington that we're going to withdraw from the program in three years. And that's a little bit like trying to recruit football and basketball players to a college program when you say, well, in three years we won't have the program anymore. No one's going to show up. And what you're really doing is you're stopping this, this very important investment in having doctors available and working in Alaska. I'm very optimistic that although the, the majority of the House passed a budget that includes this intent language, I'm very hopeful that the Senate will see what's going on, realize how important this is for Alaska, and continue the whammy program without this intent language that would kill the program. 
Uh, the second thing I want to touch base on a little bit more briefly, but a much bigger issue that's been getting a lot of attention here in the capital is Medicaid expansion. Uh, the first part that's really important to know about medica Medicaid expansion is there's over $6 million in savings in the first year alone when we accept Medicaid expansion. The second part that's been getting a lot of discussion is the whole topic of reform. And what really drives the reform in medical services and reform in cost is the market more than what the state legislature can do and more than what administrative agencies can do. The state and the administrative agencies have a part, but what's really driving cost savings is the market and that's actually already working on a national level and so we need to get on board with Medicaid reform and Medicaid expansion because they really do very much go hand in hand. Uh, the, I think the best example I can give in terms of Medicaid expansion, why, why I think we really need to accept it, is, is looking at highway funds. For, for decades, we have accepted highway funds from the federal government on a 90-10 split. It's a critical investment in our transportation infrastructure. And in the same way, Medicaid expansion with the, the market reforms that will go on when we accept Medicaid expansion is an investment not only in our medical infrastructure by having more treatment options available, more doctors available to treat Alaskans, but it's also an investment in healthy Alaskans. So those are some of the reasons why I think Medicaid expansion is such a critical issue this session and really optimistic that we will get the bill through the legislature and get it approved by the governor before the end of our 90-day session. So. Uh, happy to be here today. I think next we're going to hear from Representative Tarr, and then after that we'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Representative Garen Tarr from Anchorage, representing Airport Heights, Russian Jack, and Mountain View. Happy to be here this morning. Thanks for coming. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of my priorities, um, both Medicaid expansion as well as Aaron's Law. We are coming into the final 30 days and we have started an Aaron's Law countdown on our website. Um, so feel free to watch that. We're gonna be posting regularly if there are updates to post. We are frustrated that there's been not much movement this session. Um, we had broad bipartisan support last year. A bill passed the Senate unanimously. We worked over the interim. We were ready when we came back. We could have passed this bill early in the session. The governor called for passage of this bill on his state of the state the only piece of legislation he mentioned by name. So we should be doing more, and, and why I'm speaking out now, we've got just 30 days left. Um, we've been kind of waiting patiently, but now in this remaining time, we need to make this happen. The numbers for February are out, and there were 250 allegations of child sexual abuse in the month of February. In a small state like Alaska, 250 children's lives changed potentially forever. Um, you know, children who, who will not be the person they could have become because of being affected by this horrible, um, horrible crime. And if we just think back, if we had done something last year and we could have started implementing a bill this fall, if we look at the numbers from September through the end of February, it's 1,302 children. Um, affected by this, 1,302 allegations of child sexual abuse. These numbers consistently rank Alaska in the top 10. And what we know more than ever, there have been several presentations, this legislative session on ACEs, that's the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. We know there are lifelong consequences. We know that they're costly um, when there are things like domestic violence and substance abuse and people's personal lives. There's both a social cost as well as a financial cost. And in these tight fiscal times, more than ever, we need to focus on prevention. So this is a low cost prevention strategy that can be very effective. In this tight f fiscal environment, we've heard concerns about unfunded mandates, but we've reached out to community partners and organizations like the Rasmussen Foundation have said they'd like to be a part of this effort, that they could provide support for training and for purchasing curriculum. Organizations like the Alaska Children's Trust, the Mental Health Trust Authority, um, and the Alaska Network on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault all have expressed a strong interest in being a part of making this happen. And in fact, Mr. Jesse, when he testified in the Senate um, committee, in the Senate Education Committee, he said the real unfunded mandate is the costs that come later when we don't deal with these problems. So we've got, according to my countdown, 26 days, 18 hours, 54 minutes. I think we, there might be a slight error in that, but, but generally uh, uh, correct. And we just wanna remind people um, that we have to stay that, we have to have that laser beam focus on this effort um, going into these last days so we can complete this work. 
On Medicaid expansion, as a member of the House Health and Social Services Committee, we've had several hearings on this so far and um, looking forward to hearing a bill. Um, we haven't had a bill before us just yet, but this Tuesday we'll start hearing, in fact, uh, this afternoon we'll start hearing the governor's bill. We'll be hearing it on Thursday, and on Saturday there'll be public testimony, so we wanna make sure members of the public know this will be your first opportunity to comment on a bill. This will be Saturday, March 28th at 3 p.m. It's the House Health and Social Services Committee, so please uh, go to your local LIO or email your legislator or call your LIO, um, find out how you can uh, raise you know your voice put in putting your thoughts on that important matter um, we heard last week um, and it'd be a good work session for anyone interested in the topic on Saturday from several health care providers Becky Haltberg from the Alaska State Hospital and Nursing Association was there Mr. Sherwood from the department um, very knowledgeable about Medicaid and we've really dug into the details of um, the hidden costs the uncompensated care the super utilizers and there's just so much potential with Medicaid expansion to deliver the right care at the right time for the right cost. And I hope we complete both Aaron's Law and Medicaid expansion as two of the most um, important things that we could do this session. Thank you. So in these last days of uh, the session, we are continue to fight to make a lasting commitment to public education, making our communities safer, and uh, giving affordable, accessible health care to Alaskans and providing opportunities for all Alaskans. Questions? Yes. Not required. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, for with the Associated Press. Uh, Senate Finance this morning is hearing uh, legislation to repeal the film tax credit. Um, I'm just interested um, if it makes it over here, how you view that legislation and that effort. Well, I hope that uh, we can just put the film tax credit on hold right now until uh, our fiscal situation gets a little better where we can start investing in that. One of the nice things about the, the film tax credit is that it does promote Alaska. And you look at uh, the tourism industry and you look at the opportunities that we have there, Alaskans, I mean, people want to come visit Alaska because of the sense of adventure that we're able to portray through the film tax credit. Katie Moritz with the Juno Empire. Um, this is for Reptar. I was wondering what you think is the holdup with Aaron's Law. I just have gotten a lot of questions from readers about where it is or what's happening with it. So, just wondering. I wish I had answers to those questions. Um, I have been persistent in my pursuit of getting a hearing with Representative Keller's office. I know they've had other bills um, that they've been working on, but it looks like the bills have come through now. I don't see um, some of the important things that they've been dealing with or appears have been taken care of. So we'll keep communicating with his office. We provided the packet because since the bill hasn't had a hearing, the materials are not available online so we provided a packet and I'd be happy to share with anyone from the press of all of the letters of support there are dozens of letters of support from individuals around Alaskans sharing their personal stories there are letters from many organizations ones I didn't mention like the Alaska Peace Officers Association who know what a big problem this is in our state I'd be happy to share that letter wanted them to know if funding is an issue that we found organizations that want to be a part of this effort um, that there are community partners ready to assist. We will do everything we can uh, to make this, this bill get past this session and you know, keep reminding people that 250 children in the state of Alaska were affected by child sexual abuse in the month of February and 1,302. And those are numbers that should compel us to action. Yeah, Pat Forge, Alaska Dispatch News. Um, so what's it going to take to get out of this session and um, have you heard from anybody in the majority that they're going to say that they can pass a budget um, without a three-quarter vote to get into the CBR? Okay, uh, the, this, this last question was what again? Uh, three-quarter vote to the CBR. Okay, I think that's still yet to be determined. It all depends on how the budget, the operating budget and the capital budget and the supplemental budget, I'm sorry, that. Uh, um, how that shapes up, where we're going to see um, some of the draws come from um, for for that. Um, shaping up in the last uh, few days of session, we have about 26 more days left. Um, it's going to take people working together if we're going to get out on time. 
is going to take a fast track for the Medicaid expansion bill uh, to start moving, start having hearings. Um, I think that's one thing that's going to be very important for Alaskans who want to see as results coming out of this session is uh, some sort of uh, access to affordable health care. Let me, let me just add a little bit in terms of the timing because I was back in Anchorage this past weekend. We have most of us go back at some point and have a constituent pizza party or some other gathering for constituents. And, and one of the most consistent questions I heard was, can't you guys get this done in 90 days? What's going to what's gonna take longer? And the message I heard loud and clear from constituents is that we need to sit down, we need to get this get this done and get it done within the 90 days. I, I didn't hear any anybody in the community that sort of thought, oh, why don't you guys you know keep arguing about it for another couple of months and take it into the summer and keep talking about these issues. Alaskans want us to come together and figure out a solution. Resident Tarr. I just want to add also that we don't control the agenda. The majority controls the agenda. They control the pace. A lot of this stuff that we've talked about today are no-brainers. There's no reason why we shouldn't be further along with some of the legislation uh, that's going on in the building. Yes. Representative Tuck, when you said on, on Pat's question yet to be determined, do you mean on the pot of money for the draw or the three-quarter issue? The, uh, well, kind of a combination of both. The, where, they, where the majority can draw money from um, can determine whether or not they can just do a 50% draw off the CBR or if they take a three-quarter um, draw from the CBR. So if they want to go after the uh, permanent fund dividend earnings, they may not necessarily need a three-quarter vote to go into the CBR. And I did, uh, if I could, on, on the Medicaid expansion issue, um, we'd heard this, the $6.5, $6.6 million savings the first year. Um, but there's that sense that we're hearing on the Senate side and, and the majority that there needs to be significant savings. I guess, how do you define significant? And, and at what point do you need to see that tangible impact to know for sure that this is, um, that we're, we're getting a handle on that big cost driver? Okay. Well, already we have done a lot of Medicaid reforms. And I think this is, you know, just to put the context, already about $150 million in reforms. There are a couple things that have changed recently in terms of elig the eligibility process and what services will be paid for. Cumulatively, those things are about $350 million, or $300 million, but about half of that could be put into the what would be considered reform categories. And the department has provided us a document, I'd be happy to share, that shows all of the different reform measures, how much they expect to save from each of them, and the timeline in which they hope to accomplish them. And things like the super utilizer issue, this is really important to me because a quarter of the individuals who are in that category come from one of my neighborhoods. Um, just in that alone, millions of dollars um, have been saved with the reforms that are underway right now. And by expanding that, which is what one of the things they hope to accomplish with expansion, there's a few more million dollars that can be saved there. So there's better care coordination, there's the super utilizer issue, there's buying generics over um, the brand names, there's you know, the medical home model, the patient-centered medical home model. All of these different components of reforms um, have millions of dollars of savings attached to them. And cumulatively, it's, it is substantial. And you know, what we know is that the things that are going to come in the next year and the following year you know, we sort of have to evolve to that. Part of um, getting folks covered will be, you know, meeting the, their pent-up needs. If there are any individuals who haven't had any access to care for a long time, and then as you get people preventative services, um, then you know, then you avoid some of the more high-cost um, problems later. Let me just add just one quick thought on Medicaid expansion. It was, I remember very well when Senator Murkowski spoke to us about a month ago about Medicaid expansion. The question was asked during her speech to the legislature, what's your perspective on Medicaid expansion? It was pretty straightforward. She said, eventually all states are going to come to accept Medicaid expansion. This isn't a situation in which a whole bunch of states are going to keep not accepting Medicaid expansion. The market demand, the public demand is going to really insist that we take Medicaid expansion. And I think the governor's got it right when he says, let's get this going now, let's get it done this session, and let's really 
provide that access to health care for thousands more Alaskans. I, and one other comment on this, what we really discussed in that work session on Saturday are some of the other um, components that are, are sort of built into the Affordable Care Act with Medicaid expansion. Things like the dish payment, which is called the dis Disproportionate Share Hospital. That's a federal grant that helps, um, and in our case, it's mostly going to API to help offset costs there. There are payments that go to neighborhood health centers. We have 28 of those in Alaska. So for example, in the Anchorage area, um, at the Anchorage Neighborhood Health Center, the lowest income individuals will pay a nominal fee of $20 to have services and the difference in the cost of their care is paid for through a federal grant. And that federal grant, they hope, covers that difference. But over the next couple of years, those grants are supposed to go away, both the dish payment grants and these offset grants. Because with Medicaid expansion, it's envisioned that all of the individuals who are needing care and don't have a way to pay for it will come under that umbrella and you can phase these other things out. So we really need to do this to really fully benefit from all of these cost saving measures and to um, really get people more permanent care so they have a more stable continuum of care um, that, that leads to better health outcomes. Katie Morris with the Juno Empire. Um, I Back on the floor, and you guys were voting on the budget, um, Rep. Guerra brought a, an amendment that would have capped spending on the tourism marketing um, fund. And I was wondering if you guys are still thinking about that, talking about that. I'm just kind of curious about that money and where you all stand on that and why the amendment was withdrawn as well. I think if you want, you should ask Representative Guerra why he decided to withdraw the amendment. I, I can't speak for Reverend, uh, Representative Guerra, and part of the Part of the working within our caucus is that we are very embracing of different ideas and kind of different approaches, and I think he he made a decision not to not to go forward. But I think he wanted to raise the issue. But again, I'd ask him that question. And and oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I would just say I think ASME, where the industry pays into um, some portion of the marketing efforts, was the model he might have been looking at. And just thinking, is it good to have a conversation? about um, different opportunities. And, you know, as we've been Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, when we look at the um, Alaska Tourism Industry Association, they, there was at one time legislation to have them purchase into the um, state of Alaska's um, visitor's guide. Because there is advertisements that sell, that are sold in there. They get a lot of receipts for that. While we were doing, all we were asking, all that was being asked in that, uh, amendment was that they, they pay into that portion as well. Yes. Just heading into this last stretch, um, as we've heard from the conf through the confirmation process, um, are there any appointees that have stood out to your caucus as creating any heartburn or concerns at all? I think uh, overall we've been pretty satisfied with uh, the governor's selection on um, boards and commissions. I can't think of anything right now. Maybe individually, some of our members may have a problem um, or two, but uh, overall, I think we're pretty satisfied. Nothing's been brought up to my attention. Yeah, I noticed that on the budget debate on the floor, uh, Representative Reinbold voted along with a Democratic amendment on whammy. Are you sure there's not a role for her in your caucus? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'd like it's to say that, that uh, being the independent democratic coalition, that we are um, a coalition of uh, diverse backgrounds, um, and um, we um, are a non-binding coalition, so people can express their views, uh, vote their opinions, and uh, whether or not she decides to come with us is a decision she'll make, but we're, we're all inclusive. And as the guy that sponsored, sponsored the Whammy Amendment, you know, I talk with Representative Reinbold almost every day on the floor and you know there's times in which she she votes consistent with the majority other times she votes consistent with the minority and sometimes there was there was one vote last week when when I voted with the majority and she voted with the minor, minority and afterwards she said well what are you doing and I said well we're both voting our conscience and I'll, I'll have to say that the budget amendments probably would have turned out a little bit differently if there wasn't such a Lockdown on the on um, on the majority 
you know, when it comes down to voting the budget. If there was more freedom for people to vote their conscience, I think some of the amendments would have gone a little bit differently. So if you guys became the majority, would you change the rule to make it a non-binding caucus? Well, one of the reasons why there is a, a whip in each organization is to line up the votes, make sure the votes are there. So I would like to say that, yes, if we were in the majority, that we would have issues so well vetted that we know how we're going to vote on the floor and, and uh, we know which direction things are going to go. And if we need to make adjustments, we need to be, we make adjustments. Often the best work comes from that kind of compromise. Uh, the majority leadership said that Laura Reinbold uh, had her opportunity in committee to change the, the budget if she didn't like it. Uh, you think that's true? Uh, you guys made a lot of efforts to change the budget in committee. Uh, was even a single amendment passed in any of them, uh, subcommittees? Uh, not that I'm aware of. And, I, and there was an unusual rule that was put in this year for the budget subcommittees. And that is they wanted to have amendments drafted by Ledge Legal, who doesn't do that. This isn't a legal document, just a letter that goes to the full committee. And so there is nothing for Ledge Legal to really draft. So, And then to have that done before 24 hours, uh, we've always been able to do conceptual amendments uh, during committee. Uh, there is, uh, I think, a hiccup in the process. I think we have some new members that are on finance that really didn't know the process, trying to make things um, under their control a little bit stronger and, and messed up the process a little bit there. I know that uh, there was some dissatisfaction from a lot of members, not just ours, that uh, we, there was nobody was afforded the ability to offer amendments. Well, and just a little follow-up on that. I think to look at the whole budget process is simply who offered amendments, who didn't offer amendments, what amendments got approved, what didn't, kind of ignores the, the real effort that I think has was made and successfully in some committees. I know the Education Committee, there was a lot of criticism and a couple of others in terms of not really being very open to incorporating everyone on the committee. But uh, just by way of example, your question was about Representative Reinbold. She was on the Judiciary Subcommittee with me as well as the DEC budget subcommittee with me. And I think the majority noted that she didn't attend a lot of those budget subcommittee meetings, and they're right. She didn't make all the budget subcommittee meetings. I made every budget subcommittee meeting, and in both, particularly in the DEC subcommittee and in the um, judiciary subcommittee, I, I worked with all members of the committee to figure out a budget that we could all support. And so no one was offering amendments. Representative Reinbold didn't offer any amendments either, but I think had she offered amendments to those committees, the committees probably would have voted those amendments down. Uh, I didn't offer amendments in either committee because I worked with, the, with all members of the committee to get a budget that we all thought was reasonable under these challenging financial times. And I was on public safety budget subcommittee. I made made one amendment proposal in that subcommittee that was voted down but there were other features about the budget that in working with members of the committee we really had developed a consensus about how to approach it and and i think that you can get overly focused on amendments and not realize that really we're here to try to work together to do what's best for alaska and because the uh, budget subcommittee is so informal in that way uh, they come up with the cs based on the recommendations and in that cs Oftentimes, the dialogue that we have uh, during the budget subcommittee process and in talking with the finance chairs and finance members, we're able to get stuff into the CS. And then from that CS is where the real amendments get, um, get uh, attached uh, during the finance committee's full body. Any other questions? All right, well, don't forget to fill out your permit fund dividend do uh, next Tuesday. Thank you so much.